This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes with Nebula for free when you sign up using the link in the description. Tucked into a narrow valley straddling the border of Virginia and West Virginia lie two bodies of water. Reservoirs carved from the earth of the Allegheny Mountains. One lies uphill of the other, and a stream of water flows between the two. But if you look closely, that water seems to be defying gravity. Instead of running downhill, it's going up it. The lower reservoir is feeding the upper one. And these two lakes, and the water flowing between them, might just be a solution to a zero-carbon world. This is a story about how renewables work, what they offer for a fossil fuel-free future, and how two bodies of water nestled in the Allegheny Valley of Virginia could make that future a reality. On April 1, 2020, documentary filmmaker Jeff Gibbs released his movie Planet of Humans on YouTube. The premise of the film was simple. Renewable energy wasn't working and wouldn't save us from climate change. Throughout the film, Gibbs details the failings of the renewable industry and comes to a conclusion that teeters on the edge of a dangerous precipice. If renewables won't save us, then population growth must be curtailed. A human-caused apocalypse. If we get ourselves under control, all things are possible. This vein of environmentalist thinking has historically been used to excuse eugenicist and violent population control measures, but that is a topic for a whole different video. And many of the points in Planet of Humans have been refuted or are just simply outdated. But Gibbs's arguments epitomize a worrying trend of quote-unquote renewable bashing. A trend that rejects these young wind and solar industries wholesale without offering feasible solutions to replace them. That being said, renewables like solar and wind definitely do have problems. But these technologies are not hopeless like Gibbs seems to think. So let's briefly look at the obstacles renewables face in order to understand how to best navigate a path towards 100% clean energy by 2050. When it comes to wind turbines, a common takedown, especially among right-leaning politicians, is that they, they kill, kill the birds. birds. You want to see a bird graveyard? You just go, take a look, a bird graveyard? Go under a windmill someday. Unfortunately, this is true. In North America, wind turbines kill between 140 to 500,000 birds a year. But if you zoom out and look at the whole picture, that number looks a little different. Both a 2009 and a 2012 study revealed that fossil fuel plants caused 9.7 bird deaths per gigawatt hour produced, while turbines caused only 0.27 deaths per gigawatt hour produced. Oh, and cats kill roughly 10,000 times the amount of birds that turbines do. So when contextualized, bird deaths caused by wind turbines are comparably small. The life cycle impacts of both solar panels and wind turbines are yet another point of attack for those looking to discredit renewables. These technologies require resources to assemble, install, and eventually dismantle. So some, including Jeff Gibbs, argue that renewables are not as clean as we think they are. But according to one 2017 paper that compared the emissions from the life cycle of a variety of energy sources, solar and wind consistently produced some of the lowest impacts compared to coal or natural gas. This research reinforced an earlier widely cited 2013 study that found similar results. In short, despite the amount of concrete and raw materials required to construct wind and solar arrays, they can quickly pay off that initial carbon debt. And these technologies are comparably young. So as renewables continue to be honed, these installations will last longer and longer, making waste less of a problem. One of the largest problems facing renewables, however, is that they create too much energy. Or rather, they generate too much energy when we don't need it. Wind and solar are variable in their outputs, and produce energy when the sun shines the strongest or when the wind is blowing the hardest, which often doesn't match up with the times we need it. This mismatch means that when energy demand is low, but production is high, the grid must curtail or get rid of some of its excess energy supply or risk overtaxing the grid. 
This curtailment is happening in real time in California, which dramatically increased its solar capacity in the last decade, but has yet to build energy infrastructure to support it. As a result, the state had to curtail over 318,000 megawatt hours worth of electricity production in April of this year. And as more solar and wind plants come online, that number seems to be only growing. In short, California shows us that to successfully scale up renewables, we must also have enough capacity to use the energy these technologies produce. Which brings us to storage. Back in the Allegheny Mountains, water is still running uphill. Because, after all, this is a pumped hydro storage plant, an age-old solution to a modern problem. The Bath County Pumped Hydro Facility is one of the biggest batteries in the world, with the capacity to store over 3,003 megawatts of energy. For comparison, the capacity of the largest lithium-ion battery storage facility in the US is currently 62.5 megawatts. The facility achieves this massive energy storage through a simple method. When there's excess energy in the grid, instead of curtailing it, the facility uses this energy to pump water from the lower reservoir into the upper one. And then, when there's high electricity demand, they let the water run downhill through turbines into the lower basin like a conventional dam, fulfilling that demand. A shockingly straightforward solution to the problem of energy storage. And if done right, it can stabilize the variability of renewables so that electricity is readily available whenever we need it. There are some drawbacks, however. It requires a large amount of water for one, and it also requires mountainous terrain. But the concept of pumped hydro is being tinkered with to create alternative methods that don't require open basins or mountains. One proposal envisions a large cylindrical rock set in earth that gets pushed up with excess water when energy production is high, and then through the force of gravity pushes that water back down through a turbine when electricity is needed. But really, pumped hydro storage is just one solution of many that needs to be expanded if we are to successfully achieve 100% renewable output by 2050. Interconnectors are yet another piece of the successful clean energy puzzle. In simple terms, interconnectors combine separate grid systems, which allows states or even whole countries to trade off excess energy. So when storage is limited and demand is high, the local grid doesn't need to curtail or waste energy. It can instead transport that energy to a place where electricity is needed or can be stored for later use. These are the types of solutions we need if we are to quickly transform our electricity from fossil fuels to renewables. Technologies that are already available ready to deploy, and offer tangible solutions to the problems that renewables face. The future of renewables will not be without hiccups. But according to the Stanford Solutions Project, a 100% renewable energy system is feasible by 2050. So the biggest problem then is not technological barriers, but instead finding the political will to do the needed work and the European Union is showing that initiative. They've begun to trailblaze a path towards net zero carbon by 2050. By 2030, they will reach an average of 33% of their energy sourced from renewables, with countries like Denmark, Finland, and Austria well ahead of that amount. And crucially, the EU has and is expanding the interconnectedness of their grid. So when the sun is shining in the south of Spain, excess energy can be traded to Denmark when the wind isn't blowing through their turbines. But at the end of the day, renewables can only get us so far. Recognizing and transforming the way we in the West consume energy is also an essential part of mitigating climate change. If we continue with business as usual, will need to transform a lot more. The average US citizen consumes 10 times more energy per year than the average Indian citizen, four to five times that of someone from Brazil, and three times that of someone from China. On top of that, the wealthiest 10% of the world consume 20 times more than the poorest 10%. So if through policy and behavior change, the amount of energy that countries in North America and Europe uses decreases, then the challenge of scaling renewables to meet energy demand will no longer be as daunting. 
Creating videos on YouTube can be hard, especially if you're like me and are diving into politically charged issues like the Green New Deal and ecofeminism. The unfortunate truth is that those videos are at the whim of the algorithm and are much more likely to do poorly or even get demonetized. Which is why a bunch of creator friends and I teamed up to create a platform where we can make content without having to worry about pleasing the dreaded algorithm. It's called Nebula and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a video streaming platform that allows creators to, well, create. With exclusive content from a wide range of educational YouTubers like Lindsay Ellis, Tom Scott, and T1J, Nebula is the perfect place to consume ad-free educational content. I personally procrastinated making this video by watching Tom Scott's game show, Money. The mental trickery in that show is just so good and entertaining. But what does this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to streaming platform for thousands of top-tier documentaries, CuriosityStream loves supporting educational creators. So we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. And it's not a trial, you'll have it as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's $14.79 per year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. And since you have to stay inside, you might as well watch some world-class documentaries on climate change or listen to David Attenborough's soothing voice, or just watch Tom Scott torture your favorite YouTubers on Nebula. So if you want to support both our changing climate and educational content as a whole, go to curiositystream.com OCC or click the link in the description and sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula for just $14.79 per year. Hey everyone, Charlie here. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. There are two quick things that you can do if you want to support this channel. Share this video on Reddit, Facebook, or Twitter and consider supporting me financially on Patreon. Even a dollar a month helps this channel thrive. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in two weeks.